All right, young people, let me see your Bibles. How many of you got your Bibles over here? Amen. I appreciate all you other young people raising yours up as well. Amen. All right, I want you to use them. Now open them up to the middle of the Bible and get ready to do a speed drill. Brother Chitty, you come and preach to them now. You listen now. Open your hearts and minds to the Word of God. Thank you, preacher. All right, praise the Lord. It's good to be here today. Um, my dad says to Landmark folks uh, to tell you he loves you. And it's good to be here. This is my first time here, but it feels like home. And um, there are places you, when you travel, there are places you go and you walk in and you're like, this is us. This is us. Amen. I've been in places where you think this is not us. <laughs> uh, but this is us. And so, young people, I've got uh, handmade arrowheads. I'm looking for someone to give a handmade arrowhead to this morning. So I want you to focus this morning and listening up. We're going to have a good time this morning. We're going to enjoy ourselves. But I want you to listen to what God's got for us today. Um, preacher, I appreciate you, Brother Carter, and, and the church here, and, and all that you've done for us. Uh, we appreciate being here. If you've got your Bibles this morning, I want you to be in Matthew chapter number 5 today. Matthew chapter number 5. Um, I'll be sharing many scriptures with you today, but we're going to start right here in Matthew chapter 5. I want to be a help to you. I want you to think about this as we've gone through this week. We've had some really good preaching, haven't we? It's been an amazing week. Um, great men of God. And I'm thankful for the fact that when we open the book, every time you open it, you can get something special from the Lord. And you can get those nuggets. Amen? And so I'm thankful for the fact that we can get into God's Word this morning and get after it. Um, I am a second generation missionary. I was raised by an old rough, tough Marine. And um, dad was a drill instructor. He only raised boys. Um, if you know dad now, you don't know dad. Because he his first grandchild was a daughter, a granddaughter. His last grandchild was a granddaughter. And he never raised any girls. And so those girls have him wrapped right there. <laughs> then in July, my son had his first great granddaughter. And so dad is an old softy compared to what he used to be. I broke my arm one time and pushed, I was riding a um, dirt bike and, and broke both bones in that wrist right there, pushed that dirt bike back home with, the, with my right arm, was, was hurting, crying. He gave me about 10 minutes to cry. He said, you've had long enough to cry. Dry it up. That was dad. And he wasn't kidding. Because if I hadn't have dried it up, he'd have given me a reason to cry. If you need a reason to cry, I'll give you a reason to cry. Dad didn't raise wimps. You're going to be a man. And that's how I was raised. And so in that context, I'm going to give you a few illustrations this morning. <laughs> and you'll understand where I'm coming from today. Matthew chapter number 5. And I'm going to begin reading <clears throat> in verse number 14. The Bible says, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I don't know about you, but anytime I'm somewhere where I'm unfamiliar if it's dark, I want a light. Amen? Now, in my own home, I enjoy sleeping in the dark. I don't want any lights on. I want to be go to bed. I want all the lights turned off. When I got married, my wife does not sleep in the dark. My wife needs a night light or a light in the closet or a light in the bathroom on so she doesn't trip on her way to the bathroom at night. And, and when we first got married, she said, would you please leave the light on? And I said, why? She said, so I can see in the dark. When we were small, when we were young, my dad officiated sports all my life, college and high school sports, and so he was gone an awful lot. My mom would go through the house and she'd start turning lights off. We were little boys. Remember, my dad didn't raise wimps, right? No sissies allowed. So no crying. My mom would start going through the house, turn lights off and going, Ooh. 
We lived in a mobile home with old paneling, wood paneling, and she'd scrape her fingernails down the hallway on that wood paneling. <laughs> in the dark, as she headed your way. If she caught you in the dark, she'd tickle you to about wet yourself. But she sound like a witch in the middle of the night, walking down that hallway, scraping those fingernails, going, woo. My brother was skinny as a toothpick. He found out that he could fit between our bunk bed and the wall, the mattress and the wall. He could squeeze his little tiny body down in between there where mom couldn't find him in the dark. The only problem was he was so scared from her going, woo, that he'd be like, <laughs> and she'd find him anyway. But my brother would always say this when she started turning the lights on. Oh, she'd say, woo. And my brother would say, Mama, please leave the lights on. Please leave the lights on. Mama, please leave the lights on. There was two of us, only one of her, so we'd split up. She'd turn a light off and start heading that way. We'd run. I'd go one direction. My brother would go the other. And we'd start turning the lights back on. She'd go outside to the main breaker box. <laughs> no electricity in the house. Woo! My brother would be almost crying. Mama, please leave the lights on. Mama, please, please leave the lights on. That's what I'm going to teach you this morning. I'm going to ask you to please leave the light on. Leave the light on. We look at this passage. Verse 15 says, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. As Christians, we're supposed to be a light in a sin-darkened world, and boy, do we ever live in a sin-darkened world. Can't imagine another time in history, maybe Sodom and Gomorrah, when it's such a sinful... We call, it, we call sin good in the day and age we live in. We live in a time where they're not going to change my mind. They're not going to change these older preachers' mind. They're looking at changing your mind. They're looking at getting at you and changing you. And I'm asking you this morning, please leave the light on. Don't let the light get turned off in life. Don't turn the light. Don't cover it. Don't hide it. Let your light shine. Amen. Amen. Psalm chapter 82, verse 5, the Bible says, They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. This world's walking in darkness. This world is walking in a sin-depraved world that is just surrounding us and pumping it into our, our, our society uh, just as fast as they can. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 23, the Bible talks about that darkness. It said, how great is that darkness? We're supposed to be the light. He said, ye are the light of the world. This morning I ask you to please leave the light on. My dad and my granddad and my uncle took us to a cave in Colorado, an old mine shaft. We got to that mouth of that cave, and in the mouth of that cave, there was pyrite, fool's gold. The entire wall is just covered in solid gold, pyrite. And as a little boy, I thought, man, we're rich. They left all this gold here, man, alive. And my dad gave us a good illustration of how fool's gold works and how the devil always pays in counterfeit money. We went in that old mine shaft and went down through the to the cave, and as you get deeper into that cave, the light from the mouth of that cave gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it just disappears. When you've ever been in a cave, there is no light in there unless you carry a light in there. My brother and I, as little boys, we had little pin lights. You know the little pin light? You, you push it, and as long as you hold it, it has a little light that you almost have to look in it to see if it's on. We had a little pin light. My dad, my granddad, and my uncle all had flashlights, and I'm talking about nice, good flashlights. We went in that cave, and in that cave, as you went down, you're in the dark, you're walking, all of a sudden, there's a hole in the bottom of that cave. And we dropped rocks in that hole, and it never hit the bottom. I don't know if that was the mouth of hell or what, but you never heard it. You just heard it click and hit every now and then on the sides, but you never hear it hit the bottom. So you don't want to fall in that hole, I can guarantee you that. 
Then you go further and the cave splits into two. We went down the right side and the mountain had shifted to where the cave, instead of being the same level, had two different levels. Somebody put a ladder in there. We went down that ladder, but in that crack of that cave, that melted snow in the Colorado Rocky Mountains was coming through the crack. And as you want to go down that ladder, that ice cold melted snow goes right down your back. And then it filled that cave up as it got deeper. The water, the level of the water got deeper until we were, my dad was only about knee deep. As little boys, we were about waist deep in that water. And we realized we couldn't go any further. It wasn't going to come back up. It just kept getting deeper. So we turned around and came back out. Went to the other direction. And in the other direction, there was a cave in. So you couldn't get very far in that direction either. We turned around to come back and my uncle's light went out. My brother's knife pin light had gone out a long time ago. We're down to my dad having a light and my granddad having a light. We start heading back. We get about to where that cave splits and my granddad's light goes out. My dad's the only one with a light. We're fixing to get where that hole is in that cave. And wouldn't you know it, before we got to that hole, my dad's light went out. You ever pushed a button and nothing happens? Talk about panic. Now my dad said, son, give me your belt. Said, no, dad, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> I never wanted daddy to talk about belts, man. That was not a good plan. <laughs> he said, give me your belt. We're going to tie our belts together. Use it as rope. That way, when we get back over here by this hole, if somebody falls in, we'll just pull them back out. I said, that's pretty smart. Dad's a smart guy, man. Hand my belt. We get all our belts off. We take all our belts and put them all together, tie them all together. My dad, then me, my granddad, then my brother, and then my uncle. You talk about Spider-Man? You crawl on the side of a wall. When you don't know where that hole is that can go to hell, I don't know. I'm not anywhere near it. My dad's dragging me with that belt. Come on, boy, let's go. We get closer and closer, and then all of a sudden, I'm holding on to the belt. I'm hugging the wall. I'm going as hard as I can that wall. All of a sudden, the belt in my hand in front of me just goes loose, and I hear, Ah! My heart stopped. The belt's just hanging in my hand. My granddad behind me pushes me on the shoulder. He goes, all right, son, you're the leader now. <laughs> so, so, sir? He said, you're the leader now. We got to go. We know where the hole is now. <laughs> we got to get out of this cave so we can go get some help. If your daddy's alive, we got to get him out of that hole. And I'm thinking in the dark, why aren't you the leader now? <laughs> why am I the leader? And I stuttered and I said, uh, man, daddy, I need a light. <laughs> He said, just go forward. About the time, it's a, I'm telling you this, it's a good thing my pants were already wet. Because I was scared, y'all. I mean scared. About the time I decided to inch my way just a little bit further around that hole, my dad took that flashlight under his chin and he went, ah! My dad, my granddad, and my uncles, all lights were just fine. <laughs> they had this all planned out. Between my mom and my dad, my brother and I need a lot of therapy. Y'all pray for us. <laughs> you know what I wanted more than anything in that cave that day? Just a little light. Just any kind of light. I would have taken a match, an aim and flame, <laughs> you name it, just a little light. When we have a light, when you need a light, you don't cover it. You don't hide it. And unlike my dad, my granddad, and my uncle, you don't turn it off. Amen? 
I'll give you some things that turn off a light or hide a light or cover a light this morning. First of all, evil thoughts will cover your light or hide your light. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. When you have the mind of Christ, when you quit thinking like the world and acting like the world and talking like the world and dressing like the world and worrying about what the world has to offer, no, it is time that we have the right thoughts, godly thoughts. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, it says, Now Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. You can have God's thoughts. You can have the right thought life. You can think right. You can be thinking the godly things instead of the ungodly things. Don't hide the light. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3, the Bible says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust in the Lord. With all thine heart, lean not in thine own understanding, and in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Romans chapter 1, verse 28, the Bible says, Even so, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and God gave them over to a reparate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You better be careful about your thoughts. You better be careful about what you think about. You better guard it. You better be a watchman. You better be vigilant. The Bible talks about being sober, being vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walketh about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. What are you thinking about? Romans chapter 8 and verse 7 says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Evil thoughts turn off your life. You know, having a bad attitude is not a godly character. It's not a Christian trait. Being critical and thinking critical things, not being kind or not being caring all starts with how you think. See, it's easy to, when somebody calls your name, to call a name back. When somebody does something bad, it's easy to say, I'm going to get even, or better yet, I'm going to get ahead. Evil thoughts turn off your life. Don't hide it. Don't cover it up. Don't turn it off. Evil influences turn off your life. Number two, Galatians chapter 5, verse 7 says, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Be careful who you allow to influence you. Be careful about your friends. The Bible said that Amnon had a friend. But Amnon was not a good friend. And he didn't have a good friend in Jonah. Right, right. Evil influences turn your light on. My dad and I went to a junkyard when I was 16 years old. We found a 1982 Camaro. It was yellow. It had red flames coming over the hood. We took that thing out and we rebuilt it. The first thing he did, he said, I got to paint that because that's nasty. I said, no, dad, I love it. He said, no, I'm not going to have that parked in my driveway. Painted it pearl white. I was dying to drive that thing. Loved it. We had the interior redone. We had the, the paint job done. We had it up. It was running and doing great. I got invited to a youth, count, youth rally in Farmington, which is about 25 miles away. We couldn't go anywhere without our parents. Didn't matter how old we were. Dad and Mom were right there with us all the time. And I asked Dad if we could go to the youth rally, and he said... I'll think about it. Now, my dad, usually his first thing was, anytime you ask my dad, hey, dad, can, as soon as you ask can, he said no. 
You didn't even have to finish the sentence. He just said, no, it was the safest answer. No. That was just dad's automatic answer. I had, did the same thing with my kids until my oldest one day said, Dad, I, I said, no. He said, I was just going to ask if we go to church. I said, sure you were, son. <laughs> no. So when dad said, I'll think about it, that was good news. He didn't say no right away. About 80% of the time, he was still going to say no after he thought about it, but at least he said he'd think about it. We went. Leave us permission to go. I took the car. My brother and I went to the youth rally. Had a great time. Only problem was there was a girl at the youth rally that hung around my brother. She had a crush on my brother, and she probably stepped on a duck or something, but she... Uh, she wasn't the best thing to look at. And my brother was aggravated because he just didn't like her. And she following around like a little puppy. So the next time they had a youth rally, youth thing going on, I said, hey, let's see if daddy will let us go. He said, I'm not going. You can go, but I'm not going. I said, well, dad's not going to let me go by myself. He barely let us go together last time. <laughs> just go. And my brother said, no, I'm not going. Same thing. I went to my dad. Can I do this? I'll think about it. He came back a few weeks later, he said, your brother don't want to go. I said, no, sir. He said, do you think you can do it by yourself and be a man? Yes, sir. Gave me the strict rules, guidelines. This is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is how you do it. You better do exactly what I say when I say, if not, you're dead. And he meant it. Yes, sir. What I didn't know is that some of the youth kids at that church had gotten together with one of the adults in the church to say that they were going to have a youth rally. He lied for those kids. They were getting together in the parking lot and meeting at the church and then going off and going to a party. I was not privy to that information. I did not know that. I just knew that they were having another youth rally and I was going to go. I pulled up in the parking lot. There's guys out there blaring rock music in their cars. There's no adults anywhere. And I was confused. I looked around, I said, what is going on? One of the guys that I played sports against in that school, that Christian school there, he said, hey, you ready to go party? I said, what are you talking about? He told me their grand plans for the evening. And my heart sank. There was about 20 kids in that parking lot. And I knew every one of them. They knew me. I had a choice to make. I could just see my grave being dug. If my dad even found out I was even in that parking lot with those guys and it wasn't really what they said it was. I remember I walked over to a car. They opened the door. I got in the back seat. A girl was getting in beside me after I got in. Rock music blaring on the radio. I said, stop! Let me out. I can't do this. I know this is hard for y'all to believe, but back then we didn't have cell phones. I had to drive to a pay phone and call my house. Told my dad what was going on. He said, who's there? I gave him a list of every kid that was in that parking lot. He called every one of their parents. I didn't have those, that group of friends anymore ever again. There was only one other girl that, st that did the same thing I did. She said, I can't do this either. Eighteen other others laughed at us and made fun of us. Best decision I ever made in my life. I wasn't going to allow the influence in my life. I've got a light. It's my job to shine it. It's not my job to cover it. It's not my job to hide it or turn it off. Hey, let your light shine. Evil influences, turn off your light. Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside it shall not cleave to me. 
Evil thoughts turn off your light. Evil influences turn off your light. Number three, evil communications turn off your light. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, the Bible says, Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. See, we, we tend to speak without thinking. My dad always taught us growing up, he'd say, Boy, put your mind in motion before you put your mouth in gear. And as a little boy, I thought, what's he talking about? <laughs> but the older I got, I realized real quick, when I said something I shouldn't have said, and my mom said, what did you say? Uh, what did I say? <laughs> you ever had one of those moments where you said something, you didn't think anything of it, and somebody else looked at you funny, and you're like, what did I say? Be careful. Watch out. I said something to a girl one time, a teenage girl one time, and my mom heard it, and she said, what did you just say, boy? And I told her. I didn't even think twice about it. I told her. I said it the second time, just like that. Boom. And she just looked at me, and then it hit me. Oh, oh, oh. Then I tried to explain my way out of it. My mom said, stop. Just stop. You're not helping yourself at all. Just stop. Evil communications. Be careful what you say. Colossians 3.8 says, <clears throat> But now you also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Gossip and criticism and name calling, all those things. That's not shining your light. That's covering your light. That's hiding your light. You are supposed to have the light. If you're a Christian, you're the light of the world. Don't start covering it up. Don't start hiding it. Don't turn it off. Evil communications turn off your light. Number four, evil places turn off your light. Evil places can hide the light. The Bible said that Jonah went down to Tarshish, running from God. Wrong place. The Bible says Samson went down to Timnath. The Bible says Abraham went down to Egypt. The Bible talks about Balaam going the wrong way, and an angel was there to stop him. Be careful about your direction. Be careful where you go. Be careful about the places you find yourself in. You've got to watch out. You've got to be on guard. Hey, don't let people take you to the wrong place. Because one day you'll end up in handcuffs and somebody will be taking you somewhere you don't want to go. I've got two young men in our, that went to our Christian school. Years ago, I had the first one call me from jail. For the dawn, I'm in jail. Can you come visit me? <coughs> I've got one in jail today. Alcohol, drugs, all because he let some people influence him in going to the wrong place. All because... He covered his light. He hid his light. He turned that light off and said, I'm going to try something different. Evil places turn your light off. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, the Bible talks about to the children of Israel, God says, hearken unto me. If you'll do what you're supposed to do, if you'll go where you're supposed to go, if you'll be what you're supposed to be, Verse 6, he said, Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. But then he turns around and he says, But if you won't be what you're supposed to be, if you don't go where you're supposed to go, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, he said in verse 19, he said, Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out.
the Sunday school teacher, the preacher, the parents, the godly parents, they're not trying to give you rules and tell you what to do just to keep you from having fun. No, they want a blessing in your life. They don't want you cursed. They want you blessed. You know, my dad was so tough on us because he wanted us to turn out to be right instead of wrong. My dad wasn't tough on us just to be mean. Though there were about three years of my life where I thought he was the meanest man on earth and all he did was beat me. Now, don't get me wrong, I earned all those beatings. He whipped the snot out of us. My dad would start with a belt up in Colorado before he ever hit you in New Mexico. He was swinging from Mexico too, by the way. But dad didn't do it out of hate. Dad out of love. Want us to turn out right. Want us to be godly young men. Be careful. Because evil places turn your light off. And the last of all this morning, evil actions turn your light off. We have a small mission school. We started back in 1981. I was a teenager in school. We were getting out of break, going, getting ready to go to break, and we were on the second floor of the gym, getting ready to go down to the first floor of the gym, go play. And everybody was headed to the same stairwell when school, when break time began. And there were some girls in front of me, a younger girl named Paula, who grew up in our church and our school, and she was going to the stairs right in front of me. And I don't know if I kicked her, her shoe or her foot or what, maybe hit her in the ankle with my toe or something as I went down the stairs behind her. But something made her so mad that she turned around and slapped me in the face as hard as I've ever been slapped in my life. And I'm talking like not just a little tap. I'm talking as hard as you can swing. She slapped me and, and just totally shocked me. Before I realized what I had done, I slapped her back. Just an automatic reaction. She slapped me. I slapped her. The only problem was my mom, as a teacher, was coming out behind me out of the classroom, and she saw me slap Paula. And my mom went nuts. She screamed my name. She grabbed me, drugged me to the principal, which was my dad. When your dad's the principal, your mom's the teacher, you don't get away with anything. You can't go home with a report card that you fixed. I'll tell you this. I tried skipping school as a teenager one time. That was not a smart move. She preached at me all the way to my dad's office, dragging me and just, just knocking a snot out of the back of my head. Don't you ever hit a girl. You never touch a girl. You don't put your hands on any. You can never, I mean, just preaching at me and smacking me up and down the back of my head all the way to my dad's office. And she said, she just threw me at him and said, beat this boy. <laughs> Thanks, mom. And my dad said, what'd you do? I said, I slapped Paula. He said, you what? said, she slapped me first. He said, I don't care if she shot you. You lay your hand on a woman? And you call yourself a man? And he beat me. Just like mama said to do. And then for the rest of the week, I had to follow Paula everywhere she went. Carry everything she had all week long. And every break, walk in front of her down the steps, walk behind her up the steps, and make sure that she was safe everywhere she went for the entire week. I'll tell you this, I've never laid a hand on a woman since. I learned my lesson. You know, sometimes we do things, we have actions that we just don't think first. We just react. It's turning our light off. It's covering it up. It's hiding. You know, when we're out in the world, we're facing the difficulty of 
trying to get something taken care of, a customer service situation or a store policy or something, and we mistreat people. We represent Christ. When the Bible said be kind one to another, it didn't say just to the brothers and sisters in Christ. Evil actions turn your light off. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. Deuteronomy 6, 5 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Matthew 22, verse 37 says, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Mark 12, 30 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And uh, this is the first commandment. Luke 10, 27 says, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Sound like we're supposed to give it our all for the Lord? Does it sound like we're supposed to let our light shine for the Lord? In every area of life. Not just at church, not just at a Christian school, not just when we're around Christians. Everywhere we go. Let your light shine. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. When I was in that cave, my dad said, my light's out. The last light we had, I was a nervous wreck. I wonder if the world's looking at us and asking us, please, please leave the light on. So I'm asking you today, Please, leave the light on. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed.